The House passed a bill by a four-vote margin this week to repeal and replace Obamacare. But the bill's future is not certain, as Senate Republicans are planning to write their own version. White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders said the president will not hurry the Senate. Amazing. This is a process. We haven't put a timeline or a deadline. We want to get it right, not get it fast, and that's the, that's the focus. A major issue in the Senate version is a possible change to Medicaid. Starting in 2020, it would put caps on Medicaid funding. For more, we're joined from Washington by Sarah Cliff, senior editor for Vox. She's been closely following the debate over health care. Sarah, good morning. Good morning. Thirteen Republican senators are working to craft the new bill in the Senate. What do we expect from them, Sarah? So we expect them to issue a more moderate bill. There are a number of Republicans who are really concerned about those Medicaid cuts you mentioned, both the caps on spending, also it would end Obamacare's Medicaid expansion, which covers about 12 million Americans right now. So they're concerned about that. They are also concerned about the subsidies in the individual market. One of the things Obamacare did was give middle-income and low-income families some help buying private insurance. And those would be scaled down under the House plan. So I think there's also some concern in the Senate about those subsidies as well. Sarah, we know that you spoke with Republican Senator Bill Cassidy. He was concerned about premium increases in the House bill. What can you tell us about that? Right. So you could see a lot of Americans, particularly older Americans in the individual market, facing some really steep increases under this bill. Um, the report from the Congressional Budget Office on the earlier draft of this bill found that a low-income American who's 64 could see their premiums go up 750 percent. Those are people who often vote Dem or, excuse me, vote Republican. So there's a political concern and a policy concern that you could see some people pretty frustrated with some big premium increases like that. Sarah, you wrote a piece breaking down the winners and losers uh, from this House vote, and you put President Trump down <laughs> as both a winner and a loser. Why is that? So I think he's a winner because he got something done. It's been a, an administration so far that has not had a lot of legislative wins, that has really struggled to get off the ground. So they moved this through the House when a lot of us were expecting it might not make it. That being said, you know, I, one of the things President Trump has done repeatedly is promise that this bill will cover everyone. It'll protect people with pre-existing conditions. And there are a lot of ways that the promises he has made just aren't true. They are not the bill that the House passed doesn't live up to his promises. And if it becomes law, he, he's going to have to confront that at some point when people realize, you know, they don't have coverage or that their premiums did go up under this plan. So I think it's fair to say he's both the winner and the loser. He moves something forward, but it's not the bill that he has been describing in a lot of the interviews he has done. Sarah, there's unusual unity between uh, medical groups, doctors groups, patient groups, and insurers in opposition to what the House passed. We haven't gotten a score from the Congressional Budget Office yet, but is your expectation that it will be more politically uh, questionable or difficult for lawmakers to stand behind than the previous score? That's a great question. And so we're expecting a score from CBO maybe this week or next week. And it's not totally clear what it's going to look like. Our best guess is it'll probably be in the ballpark of the last score, which found that 24 million Americans would lose insurance coverage. And we're going to see how legislators deal with this. One of the differences this time is in the first CBO score that came out before the vote, and the vote never happened, in part because that score was so toxic when it found that millions of Americans would lose health insurance coverage. Now, House Republicans have already taken that vote. Um, they didn't know how many people it covers, how much it costs, but they're going to have to stand by that vote and defend it when we get these numbers on the bill in the near future. Sarah, if this Republican health care plan becomes law, how do you think it might affect the millions of Americans who are on private employer-based health plans? So most of us won't feel a change. There are about 160 million Americans who get health insurance at work, and this bill doesn't do a lot to change that. There is one possible way they could change. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported a story earlier this week finding a loophole in the Republican bill that would allow insurance companies to bring back lifetime limits, so essentially to cap insurance benefits at usually one or two million dollars. This is something a lot of employer plans did before the Affordable Care Act, which outlawed this practice. It doesn't affect most of us, but it does affect people 
who have especially high health care bills, or there are a number of cases of babies born premature who need a lot of care in the NICU who would get affected by lifetime limits. So that's the one way it seems to intersect with employer-sponsored insurance. But generally, people who get coverage at work should not expect much change. Sarah Cliff in Washington this morning. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.